The Democratic Republic of Congo set to free two Rwandan soldiers as hundreds of Congolese hold anti-Rwanda protests. The World Health Organization seeks to strengthen monkeypox surveillance and response actions in African countries. Plus, the United Nations warns that the Horn of Africa is suffering its worst drought in 40 years. Hello and welcome to the program. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Layo or Larry Day. We begin the program with more on the rising border tensions between neighboring countries, the DR Congo and Rwanda. Angolan President Jao Lorenko says the Democratic Republic of Congo has agreed to release two Rwandan soldiers it detained last week. Mr. Lorenko, who is serving as a mediator, made the announcement after separate talks with his Congolese and Rwandan counterparts. His office said Felix Shisekedi and Paul Kagame had agreed to meet face to face in Angola. However, he did not give a date of that meeting. Rwanda and the DR Congo have accused each other of aiding armed militias in the border region and encouraging attacks. Meanwhile, hundreds of people have staged a protest in the Congolese capital, Kinshasa, to denounce Rwanda's alleged backing of the M23 rebel group. The protesters blame Rwanda over its alleged support for the rebels, calling the Rwandan ambassador to be expelled. On Monday, the chairman of the African Union, the Senegalese president, Maki Sall, held a phone call conversation with the Rwandan and Congolese leaders, trying to ease tensions between Kigali and Kinshasa. Mr. Saul had earlier expressed grave concern at the rising tensions between the two countries, and he appeals for dialogue to resolve the dispute. The UK government says the first flight carrying asylum seekers from Britain to Rwanda is expected to take place in two weeks. Now that's under a plan announced by Prime Minister Boris Johnson in April that has drawn criticism from both inside and outside his Conservative Party as well as many charities. The UK's Home Office said on Tuesday that an initial group of migrants had started to receive formal letters telling them they are being sent to Rwanda to rebuild their lives in safety. Well, in a statement, Home Secretary Priti Patel said the first flight is expected to take place on June the 14th, but did not say how many asylum seekers would be on the first flight to Rwanda. The British government says the scheme is designed to break people smuggling networks. Last year, 28,000 people made the crossing from mainland Europe to UK, mostly in small boats. The United Nations top humanitarian official for Somalia is warning of the devastating outlook for millions of affected Somalis amidst heightened risk of farming. Accompanying Somalia's newly appointed drought envoy, Abdi Rahman Abdi Shakur, on his first field visit, Mr. Adam Abdelmoula says the situation is extremely dire and grim. Mr. Abdelmoula was speaking at the ADC camp for internally displaced people in the Baidoa district of Somalia's southwest state. The situation is extremely dire and grim. 7.1 million people are going to be affected by this drought situation before the end of this year. And unless we scale up and step up our response, unfortunately, many, many people, including uh, at least, at least 330,000 children, will perish before the end of the month of June, which is next month. So that tells you how there the situation is. I'm here to mobilize as much as possible resources and coordinate the efforts 
of humanitarian assistance by Dawa is the most uh, where the people who are most affected uh, come and, and arrived recently uh, closer to the half of the, those who are, are displaced from uh, drought are here in Baydawa. And we call international community to double their effort and support Somali people in this difficult time. With the limited resources that we have, we have only been able between the months of January and April to reach 2.4 million out of all those in need of humanitarian assistance. Meteorological organizations, together with humanitarian partners, are warning of the threat of starvation in East Africa after four failed rainy seasons. They are predicting that the situation is set to worsen due to forecasts of an unprecedented fifth poor raining season between October and December. Speaking at a news briefing at the United Nations in Geneva, spokesperson Claire Nullis from the World Meteorological Organization said that the agencies have issued a joint alert and there are concerns that the situation may get worse. The joint alert was made by 12 organizations, including the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, the World Food Programme, UN Children's Fund and the World Meteorological Organization and the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. Meteorological agencies, and that includes the World Meteorological Organization, along with humanitarian partners, um, have issued a joint alert that the threat of starvation looms in East Africa. This is after four failed rainy seasons. Um, we are particularly concerned that the situation is set to get worse. In this alert, we say that the current extreme, widespread and persistent multi-season drought, which is affecting Somalia, parts of Kenya and Ethiopia, is unprecedented. Climate change is leading to more intense and severe extremes um, and it's also increasing air temperatures as we've seen in, in East Africa this year. Um, so that worsens droughts because it increases um, the loss of moisture from plants and soil. Quoting the IPCC, um, in Africa, agricultural productivity growth has been reduced by 34% since 1961 due to climate change, more than any other region. The United Nations mission in South Sudan, Bangladeshi Marine Unit, has received a brand new accommodation barge to aid its operations in the country. According to officials, it is an essential infrastructural infrastructural upgrade for increased operational readiness. The River Nile waterway is critical for the UN mission in South Sudan from Bangladesh, stationed at Mangala port, to supply essential rations, fuel and equipment to their counterparts in Malakal, Upper Nile. This logistic operation is called Operation Lifeline. When I say lifeline, it really means that in literal meaning. It's a lifeline for the mission because we carry all the logistic goods, especially which are the life-saving ones like fuel, like ration and all of our stores to the areas where the roads communication are not there. And we use this river route to do that. So this is very important for us. Peacekeepers traverse 1,000 kilometers by water crossing 42 checkpoints, carrying enormous amounts of supplies that enable the unmissed presence in Malakal sustain itself for more than three months at a stretch. Well, I think we have to take a step back and recognize that in a country which is as challenged as this one is for road transport, uh, the river is a very accessible, efficient and cheap form of transport. And with a View to exploiting that, it raises the question of having the necessary force protection to guard our patrols. And that responsibility has fallen upon the Bangladesh Marine Unit. The perils of the water are not the only challenge that seven rotations of Bangladeshi peacekeepers have faced. Their living conditions were extremely dire. 
They were sleeping in tents above fuel containers, an arrangement that brought with it strict security restrictions. We are here today because the marine unit has had a significant upgrade in its accommodation from a situation where really the accommodation was substandard and we've finally been able to address it. We, we had the opportunity to engage with the unit to find out what exactly they do. Not only what they do on a day-by-day -day basis, but where it fits in to the overall operation. And they are bringing a lot of uh, advantages uh, to this mission. Uh, particularly, you know, that it's not very easy to transport things here, given the situation that mobility is restricted, the weather is the challenge, and then there's no much infrastructure. So taking the advantage of the River Nile, um, and the, they are carrying a lot of goods, which is quite economical. And, and, and not that time consuming that we talk about. Within 12 to 15 days, the resources are available there in the upper, upper Nile area. And they're not doing it for the first time. They have done it 52 times ever since they have deployed here. And this is the 53rd one where they are going to take the, the new accommodation barge that they have. I think there's an increasing appreciation of the need for the mission to be more agile and mobile and to cover more ground in its operations. And of course, uh, access through the river gives us another arrow in our quiver, so to speak. Um, but I'm also conscious that uh, there could be elections here in the near future or near to medium term future, which will impose quite significant responsibilities to look after the logistics. Elections are logistics heavy. And uh, that will certainly implicate our river on uh, uh, elements as well as our road transport elements. The new accommodation barge will provide a much needed respite to these peacekeepers as they carry out their duties. Mali has denied allegations in the United Nations reports that its national army, FAMA, carried out human rights violations. A report by the country's United Nations mission released last week highlighted alleged gross rights abuses by the Malian army between January and March this year. It attributes to FAMA an exponential rise in abuses, including summary executions and forced disappearance in the quarterly reports on the 26th of May. On Mali's Foreign Affairs Ministry, well, the ministry issued a memo offering detailed rebuttals and various parts of the UN reports. According to the ministry, the allegations were intended to damage the image of the defense and security forces, and it says it's to discredit it in respect to the population and the international community. The medical director of the largest referral hospital in Ethiopia's Tigray region says the hospital has suspended its regular operations due to lack of medicines and medical supplies as well as power outages. Dr. Kibram says the Ida referral hospital has reached a point where it could not no longer provide services after 18 months of war in the northern region of Ethiopia. Doctors in the hospital had been working without pay for more than a year and set to not be able to support themselves or their families any longer. According to the UN, the country has been under an undeclared curfew since Tigray forces took control of the region last June, with many people in need of medical treatment and also dying due to a lack of medicine. We have more stories for you on Network Africa, including an Egyptian team develops a system that could introduce everyday life via the metaverse. Please stay with us for more details. Welcome back to the program. The World Health Organization says that while monkeypox virus has not spread to new African countries where it is not common, it has been expanding its geographic reach in recent years. The WHO cites Nigeria, where the virus has spread from the south, where it, it was mainly reported until 2019, to central, eastern and northern parts of the country in subsequent years. 
The WHO says it is working with partners to better understand the magnitude and the cause of a global outbreak, as many cases are being reported in non-endemic countries that have not previously had significant spread among people with no travel to endemic zones. Well, the WHO has also called for a common response, including surveillance, while scaling up readiness and response to curb any further spread. According to the organization, seven African countries have cumulatively reported about 1,400 monkeypox cases this year up to mid-May. These include over 1,300 suspected and 44 confirmed cases. About 3,000 travellers in South Africa have been left stranded after the Comair airline abruptly suspended all its flights with immediate effect. The airline announced the suspension on Tuesday evening, citing financial problems. However, angry customers say the airline offered specials and accepted bookings just hours before announcing the suspension. While Comair is seeking more funding to be able to resume operations, the firm says it has been affected by the coronavirus-related travel restrictions and the recent increase in fuel prices due to the Ukraine-Russian war. Well, two years after their closure, Spain has reopened the borders with its North African enclaves, Queta and Melilla, to Moroccan workers following the resolution of a drawn-out diplomatic crisis. The frontiers were initially closed at the height of the coronavirus pandemic, but later became part of a row over migration and the issue of Western Sahara. There were tensions in May last year when Madrid allowed Barim Ghali, that's the leader of the Western Saharan independence movement, Polisario, to be treated for coronavirus in a Spanish hospital. 10,000 migrants then surged into Quetta as Moroccan border forces looked on a move widely seen as retaliation by Rabat. Authorities in Côte d'Ivoire are concerned about illegal logging and pollution in the Ivorian commercial capital Abidjan's Banco National Park. Well, a concrete perimeter wall is being built with the hope that it will preserve its instinctive ecosystem. Banco spans more than 34 square kilometers of western Abidjan making it the second biggest urban park in the world behind only Rio de Janeiro's Tijuca National Park. Some of its wildlife, which includes monkeys, chimpanzees and 500-year-old trees, is considered sacred by locals and its shady trails are a haven for hikers and bicycle riders from the city of 5 million traffic-clogged streets. But Banco is threatened by pressures from Abidjan's rapid growth. Officials say local residents illegally chop down trees to build houses and dump their trash in the woods and parks. Officials hope to put an end to that. In reality, it's 12 kilometers of fencing for a perimeter of 24 kilometers. You can see where the highway is, there will be no fence because there are no major problems there. However, neighborhoods on the edge of the forest need fencing because a lot of the boundary has already been whittled away here and there to build urban lots. Tondo Sama said he hoped the efforts to protect Banco would help it win a place on UN agency UNESCO's list of World Heritage Sites. Mikale Kimani, a tourist from Kenya, was already enthusiastic. He says preserving the park remains essential. I wanted to see in Abidjan, where can I take a walk? Somewhere green, nice, beautiful, you know? and. That's why I think they should preserve this forest. It's good for uh, feeling fresh and walking. And uh, out of the heat of Abidjan, Abidjan is really hot. Yeah, so the forest is good for for running, for resting, for exercising. They should preserve it for 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 for, for humans. You know, yeah. Parks authorities have been working with local communities to head off any misunderstandings related to the wall and emphasized the importance of protecting the forest.
Gambia's president, Adama Barrow, has been on a four-day trip to Equatorial Guinea. That's where former president Yaya Jame is living in exile. All this comes days after the Gambia said it is ready to prosecute the 57-year-old ex-president for a myriad of crimes committed during his 22-year rule. And that's according to a recommendation of the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission. Well, no mention was made in the media reports of Mr. Jame, who has lived in Equatorial Guinea since January 27, while he went into exile after a shock electoral defeat. In a statement released on Tuesday, Gambia's office of the president said the two countries signed several accords at a ceremony at the presidential palace in the capital, Malabo. Well, these include one that focuses on strengthening diplomatic ties and a mutual visa waiver scheme for those holding diplomatic and official service passports. Finally, on the program, let's take you to the world of virtual reality. An Egyptian teen and AI junkie is developing a system that he hopes will one day allow people to go shopping and allow students to attend their classes via the metaverse. Take a look. Wearing a virtual reality headset and black and yellow wired gloves, an Egyptian teenager is hoping to build his own version of the metaverse, allowing people to one day shop, attend classes, or even conduct experiments online. Omar Wael, a 13-year-old developer and AI junkie, became fascinated by the world of virtual reality after watching Ready Player One, a 2018 science fiction movie in which much of the humanity uses a virtual reality simulation. This inspired him to start working on his own version of the project. His idea started taking shape when the metaverse became more easily accessible thanks to tech companies investing billions into the industry in the past few years. Using some of his mother's old clothes, Wael developed a sensory vest and glove. He also started working on a software which he hopes will allow pupils like himself attend classes via the metaverse. This headset is considered the head in the virtual reality world, with which I can see what is happening left and right, go up and down. It is the player's head inside the virtual reality world. This saves the environment and reduces traffic. Researchers who work on chemical experiments won't have to buy expensive chemical material. They can simply carry out the experiment in a virtual lab to simulate and see what happens in reality exactly. The teen's passion for AI and technology started when he was only five years old. He built his first robot when he was nine. Wael won various local and international awards for his project, The Other World, for which he hopes to secure funding to enable him develop it further. And that's it on the program today. Thank you for watching. I'm Layo Olarnidi.